Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Jason and today we're talking about the practical considerations in managing a paperless office. I recently spoke about this as part of the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago's continuing legal education series on data protection and data security. Here's a look at that presentation. Okay, so the topic itself is an exciting one. Um, it's supposed to be best practice versus current practice, or current practice versus best practice. But I've retitled it just practical consideration. We often think of data protection when we hear the term data protection as an IT term, something that affects um, persons who specialize in information technology, maybe persons in the banking sector, but we really, very rarely think about how it affects lawyers. And it does affect lawyers. So the first consideration that we should look at is how do lawyers use IT currently? How do lawyers employ or implement a paperless office? Is a paperless office even a possibility? And what are the vulnerabilities and risks that are involved in managing data in a law firm, in a chamber's environment, or even if you're a sole practitioner just operating off of a laptop? So, first of all, what is the current system? How paperless can we really go? So, in terms of paper versus paperless, on the left-hand column, we have the paperless. On the right-hand column, we have paper. So let's look at paper first. Of course, we all know that our current court rules require physical documents to be filed. We can't get away from it. We have to file documents physically. Very large and voluminous bundles of documents sometimes. And of course, we know that in dealing with paper, there are original documents that may be generated or required for filing. Deeds may be generated, certificates of title may be kept at the land registry. If you're doing a divorce, for example, you may have to file a marriage, an original marriage certificate. In probate, you may have to file original death certificates. You will deal with, um, you may require an original birth certificates. Sometimes if you're dealing with pleadings, you may be able to file a certified copy or a copy, a true and correct copy. But the reality is we still file or generate original documents. So we can't get away from paper just yet. And maybe we don't want to. On the paperless side of things though, you may find now that correspondence and other documents may be sent and received electronically or they may be scanned. We all use email now. Very often if we're communicating with the court or with the other side in a matter, we will actually print a letter, but we will scan that letter and send it to the other side. It gets there faster. Sometimes we don't even print the letter. We just format it on an electronic letterhead we may put an electronic signature or we might actually go the painstaking route of signing that document, then re-scanning it and sending an electronic copy to the other side. So that's how we deal with correspondence now. Orders. We've started to receive orders via the judiciary's court mail system. And while it's not perfect as yet, certainly measures have been taken to send us our orders electronically and certainly in the future we will be getting all our orders via the court mail system we're getting orders in the court mail system for most civil high court actions they're not yet ready in family actions they're not yet ready in criminal actions and they're certainly not yet ready in the magistrate's court jurisdiction but for most civil actions we are getting our orders via court mail and of course, we interface with technology in the paperless realm when we're dealing with draft documents. We create documents in word processing software. I don't think anybody really uses typewriters nowadays. Um, if they do, maybe few and far between. But certainly, Microsoft Word is the standard in terms of, of how we create our documents. And you often find in the civil arena, particularly, 
judges asking that you send your documents in Word format, not PDF format, but they want the submissions that you send in Word format. They might want a draft order sent in a Word format so that it's easy for their court staff, for the judicial support officers to manipulate that document and make any changes that might be made, etc., or assist them in writing their judgments with the submissions, etc. So certainly we have a dual system. I think we will have a dual system for a long time coming. But on the paperless side of things, how we deal with the information is of concern. There are obviously ethical considerations that we have to take into account. And I know that Mr. Charles will be dealing with some of those ethical considerations later on, particularly as it relates to the Legal Profession Act and what our requirements are. Obviously, there is confidentiality. Confidentiality is a no-brainer for all attorneys. Everything must be held in confidence. And of course, when you are using technology, there is always a risk. And how we manage that risk is really what we have to take into consideration as we move forward. So, getting started in the digital or paperless realm. So, we've said that we are going to maintain a dual system for a while. It's very unlikely that we can do away with paper as the system currently stands, certainly with the rules as there are. If you are an attorney practicing in the um, civil realm, well, the CPR, we've heard from the judiciary that e-filing is coming and it may come sooner rather than later. The court mail system is meant to bring on board the potential for e-filing, and that is something that we are certainly looking forward to. But if you're a practitioner practicing in multiple areas, civil, criminal, probate, family, getting away, getting away from people is not in the near or foreseeable future. But we may want to reduce the amount of people we have at our office, and certainly it makes life much manageable. It's obviously much easier to walk around with a tablet, computer, or laptop rather than with a very big file. Although some persons may tell you the file is always foolproof. You always have your file, but then there's so much paper that you have to deal with, particularly if you're using, um, if you're dealing with large bundles of documents. Sometimes it's difficult to, to um, maintain a file. Of course, there would be uses for a file if, for example, you're at a trial, you need to point a witness to something while on the stand. Obviously, paper, you're dealing with paper. But if you want to reduce the amount of paper, then there are certain strategies that you can employ at your office to get there. So let's look at the essential equipment that we need. And of course, a scanner goes without saying. You need to have a scanner. In order to turn paper into bits, you will need some sort of document scan. Many offices, particularly larger organizations, firms, etc., may have an all-in-one machine. We know those big, large Xerox machines that can scan and can print and photocopy. Or you may even have a, a smaller inkjet printer that can scan and make copies as well, an all-in-one machine. Um, which can scan. And that's fine for, for some types of operations. But if you really are serious about reducing the amount of paper and at least trying to go as paperless as you can, it may be worthwhile to invest in a dedicated scanner. All right. And when it comes to a dedicated scanner, there are many options. I'm not here to give any endorsement for any particular brand. But I know that the standard when it comes to dealing with volume is the Fujitsu Scan Snap. It's a very um, good product, a very versatile scanner, and it can deal with a high volume of documents. Because the last thing you want to do is say you're going paperless and then have to feed one page at a time. Of course, we, we would want something that can be... Um, can handle volume. Of course, that's not the only option that is available. We, those photocopying machines, these Xerox machines, can do batch scanning. But then, of course, you also have to be wary of paper jams, which can be even more of a headache 
than uh, and, uh, um, providing any assistance in the scanning process. So you would want to do your research, look at the reviews of the products, and invest in a product that will optimize your efficiency in terms of scanning. Of course, you might also want to have scanning on the go. So you may want to have a portable scanner, and there are portable scanners that are available. If, for example, you are at court, you're typing up or you're writing up a draft order and you want a scan of it, a portable scanner may be the way to go. Or, of course, the old-fashioned phone. You might want to get a scanning app, a dedicated scanning app on your phone. I mean, you can always take a picture, but you want to have um, something that can convert a document on the go to your scanning workflow. And, of course, that's just for the rare times that you're on the road or at court or happen to be in a place where you need a quick portable option. That's not your usual state of affairs. So you wouldn't be scanning with your phone in your office for bulk documents. All right, so a scanner would be one of those, um, well, it is the essential item for, for your law office. Now, again, a batch scanner or a scanner that can handle a high volume of paper would be ideal in a situation where you have very voluminous bundles of documents, um, very volu voluminous documents that, that, that need to um, be, be filed, etc. You receive a bundle of documents from the other side, a, a batch or a, a high density scanner would be the most ideal thing in those circumstances. Of course, you would also need to have a PDF editor, not just a PDF reader but a PDF editor. And a PDF editor would be essential in terms of rearranging or rotating documents because, again, you're dealing with technology. So you're scanning something. It may not always scan right side up or left to right. You will have to rotate. So you would need to invest in a product that will allow you to do that. And there are a wide range of products. Of course, Adobe is the, um, the standard product, Adobe um, Acrobat um, Pro. But of course, it's very expensive. So there are alternatives as well that can provide the same service. You would want a product that's not only capable of rearranging or rotating, but also capable of redacting documents. You may want to redact sensitive information in certain circumstances. Or maybe you might have, for example, documents that you need to file that you need to redact. So you would want to make sure that your scanner, your, your PDF editor can do that. Otherwise, you'll have to print it, use a marker, redact it, rescan it. So you would want a software to be able to do that. Numbering of documents, particularly if you're dealing with a bundle, you have to generate a table of contents. So your PDF application should be able to number the documents so that when you're generating a paper or table of contents, you can easily do that without having your staff. And this is what happens in reality in our office. The staff goes through the documents and numbers one by one. I think it happens in most law offices. But again, if we want to be efficient, if we want to be optimum, our PDF editor should be capable of numbering documents. You, of course, want to make sure you have optical character recognition compatibility so that when a document is scanned into the PDF editor, you are able to generate the text of that content so that you can use it in your drafts, of, um, in your, in your so word processing software, etc. So you would want to have that opt optical character recognition um, for your documents as well. Another essential in terms of equipment is storage. And I have... In terms of storage, I have cloud in brackets. Cloud storage may or may not be right for everyone, but there are certain things that you want to take into consideration. So in terms of your storage, what do you want? You may want the ability to sync and save while you work, which would mean a cloud system. You may want the ability to work anywhere and to grant access to colleagues and employees. Or you may very well not want those things. You may want to have something that you know is at your office and that can only be accessed by employees or by machines at your office. So again, that is a judgment call. It depends on how you work. But an external hard drive may or may not be a viable storage mechanism for this purpose because 
we will come later to mitigation against data loss. We will come later to the threat of, of um, hacking. So whatever type of storage system that we have in place, we want to ensure that we have thought about data loss and accidents in the process. So let's talk a little bit more about storage. So there are really two types of, of storage systems that most attorneys tend to have in place currently. The dedicated on-site server, where it's held at your office and can only be accessed at your office. Some, lawyer, some law firms or some attorneys may have a server that allows for remote access via a virtual private network or allows for some sort of, of, of cloud compatibility. Of course, that comes with its own issues, but factors to take into consideration in terms of the dedicated on-site server cost. And depending on how you look at it, it can be a minimal cost or it can be an expensive cost. Servers may be expensive and as an investment, particularly for a single or sole practitioner. But it may actually be cheaper in the long run than paying a subscription over an indefinite period of time. So cost is something you want to take into consideration. Maintenance. It's equipment you're dealing with. Equipment tends to malfunction at some point in time. Equipment may need servicing. Equipment may need upgrading. So maintenance of your dedicated server is something that we would want to take into consideration. Security and vulnerability. How open are you to hacks? What is the threat like? And I know that Mr. Parasram will be speaking about hacking later and what to do if you're hacked. And Mr. Charles will be speaking about mitigating against hacking. But of course, what are the security and vulnerability concerns of a dedicated server? Damage and destruction. So it's raining cats and dogs in Port of Spain right now. I understand the streets are flooding. What if that water came into your office, into your server room? What would happen in the event of a fire? These things need to be taken into consideration. And of course, again, lawyers are sometimes um, very happy-go-lucky people. We are supposed to keep our files in file-proof cabinets. Does that always happen? I'm going to leave that as an open question. It's the same consideration that we have for our dedicated server. In terms of a cloud-based system now, there are also factors to take into consideration. So we spoke about cost earlier. Cloud-based systems tend to be subscription-based. Yes, there are free options, but the free options, you will find that you will run out of space very, very quickly. So you will have to end up paying for some sort of package, some sort of storage package. And of course, the cost may vary per user. It may be, a, 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 depending on how many employees or how many persons who have access, the cost may vary. So cost of subscription may be, is, is a factor to take into consideration. And of course, if you're investing in, a, in that type of service, then you're signing up for an indefinite subscription because your subscription will be renewable monthly or annually. And you're, of course, now at the mercy of the provider um, in terms of the fees going forward, the fees may raise. And what are you going to do? How easy it, is it going to be to switch from one provider to another if you're not satisfied with the service or if you're not satisfied with the fee? So that is something that you want to take into consideration as well. And then, of course, there's security and vulnerability. Now, many of the vendors of these cloud services, Dropbox, Box, Google Drive, etc., cetera, um, give assurances that their services are safe and are secure. But we've heard of privacy concerns with Google recently. Is it really secure? Is Google really the option that you want to use for your cloud system? Is anything really secure? There are, doc there are services like NetDocs, for example, that tailor products to clients with sensitive information like attorneys, um, which may have, um, you, you may feel that they may be re more reliable. But again, there is always a risk. There is still a risk. And we'll talk about those risks a little later on. Let's talk a little bit about the paperless workflow. So we know we have to have a scanner. We know we need to invest in storage. But how do we organize this information as we go forward? So the cardinal rule is that we need to have inbox-centric thinking. 
just as how you have an inbox in your in your email, everything that comes in comes to your inbox and then you sort from there, just as how you may have an entry in your office, a physical entry where everything that comes in comes into one central location and from there you sort, we must have a method. We have to have a method to the madness. It can't just be a haphazard method of, of working in a paperless environment. And my recommendation, and I think the recommendation of all the experts, is that it should be an inbox-centric workflow where everything that comes in should be immediately scanned before any action is taken. You can't say, I'll scan it later, I need to work on this now and come to it, then you are going to end up in chaos. You need to scan immediately. That is a cardinal rule. If that rule is breached, that should be grounds for dismissal, even if you're dismissing yourself. But the cardinal rule, anything, do not leave anything um, unscanned. It must be scanned before you do anything else with it. Of course, after you've scanned the document, then you need to figure out where you're putting it. So again, your filing cabinet approach. Just as how we have a filing cabinet, we would want to organize it the same way. So subfolders within client names and your subfolders may include drafts, pleadings, correspondence. However, you would normally organize your files. You might have billings. Um, again, that, that organizational structure is really up to you and what works most efficiently for you. But there must be a system. You can't just have one folder and the whole caboodle goes into one folder. Then you're not going to be able to find anything. Now, we should recognize also that drafts are different from documents. And I think this is a mistake that I see many attorneys making. A Microsoft Word document is not a finalized document. It's a draft document. It might be the final version of the draft document, but that's not the document that's filed. The document is the document that is signed or signed and filed or received from the other side. That is the document. The latest or last word version of the document before it went for filing is not a document. So that should be always in your drafts and your actual documents would be the PDF file. And that is very important to take into consideration. Because again, if a judge asks you for a, a document, you don't want to be sending the Word document unless they specifically ask you for the Word document. You want to send the document, the, the, the scan document, or the other side, etc. Of course, we all know Word documents can be subject to editing. So we want to have the last, um, the, last the, the PDF document in our documents folder and not confuse drafts with documents. And of course, it goes without saying, if you have an electronic signature in Word and you send that document to someone else, then you are compromising your electronic signature for all and sundry to use. And we are already seeing problems at the land registry with fraudulent deeds, with signatures that have been taken um, from documents and, and are appearing on deeds. So, Basic common sense, but things to take into consideration moving forward. We don't send a, a, um, a word document that could be manipulated with a signature to anyone else. We would want to adopt a standard naming convention for ease of access. Again, that's up to each individual um, attorney or firm, but it needs to be a policy across the board. It cannot just be if I'm in an office with three other attorneys and I do my own thing, and everyone else um, follows a different naming convention. There needs to be a standard naming convention across the firm, across the chambers, so that documents may be found. So you might want to start with the, the year, the month, the date, the name of the document, rather than a haphazard list of, of, of things that you need to search through and find. Of course, the search tools allow you to find things by searching, but it makes life much easier um, if you have a standard naming convention, so you can file things quickly and easily. You would want to allocate a period for tidying up of your digital file cabinet, just as how you may have every month or every quarter, um, you may close your office and this, this happens or, or allocate a weekend for tidying up of the cabinet and going back and maintenance of the files. You need to do that as well with the digital files because you may want to move things. You might want to move files from open to close. You might want to um, move. You, you, there may be files that work as 
been completed, but then you may have billing issues, a client, you may have accounts receivable still on a file. So you want to tidy it up. You want to be able to move things around. And this is not something that you can just do on a haphazard basis. This is something that should be organized. This is something that should be scheduled so that you can get that done um, in an allocated time in an efficient manner. And of course, you need to train your staff in your workflow process. It makes no sense to have a process if there's not going to be continuous training. So any new member of staff that comes in should get some training on the naming convention, the organizational method, etc. And of course, the inbox-centric workflow. So that is really how the ideal paperless workflow should operate. Let's talk about backup now. And these are just some questions. Questions to take into consideration. And really, this now segues into our other speakers. And I think next we will ask Mr. Douglas to speak about data protection because it will flow nicely into, into where we go from here. But in terms of backup, what happens if disaster strikes? That disaster might be physical, fire, flood, etc. What systems do we have in place for backup? Is your backup system organized and retrievable? If our workflow is going to be organized, then our backup system needs to be reorganized as well. We might say we've emailed documents to ourselves. Okay, great. How searchable is that? How retrievable is that? We want to make sure our backup system is also as organized and as efficient. Can you go completely paperless? there's a certain level of fault tolerance that we have to take into consideration. A parallel system of paper and paperless. And I think that's what most of us do right now. We have our paper files and we also have a mirror or we try to have a mirror electronic copy of our files. But they always say nothing beats old-fashioned paper. And while we're here talking about data protection and information technology, the paper file is in itself a backup of the digital file. And of course, basic things to take into consideration. Do we have UPS systems? Do we have auxiliary power supplies if electricity goes? Are our devices going to be charged if we're going to court? You decide you're not taking your physical file to court. You're just taking an iPad. And of course, the battery dies. Or you're going to write with a stylus rather than a pen. Your stylus isn't charged. What happens? So of course, these are measures that we need to take into consideration. And of course have our physical file as a, as a parallel system just in case. In terms of other considerations, very briefly, when it comes to technology, it's always good to indemnify yourself against problems. So you want to have an indemnity against your data being, a client's data being compromised, either in your retain agreement or you're in your engagement letter, or perhaps you may even have a separate, I know some firms have a separate confidentiality agreement. You may want to have a clause there, dealing with data breaches, dealing with hacking, etc. Because again, it is going to be a breach of your code of ethics. So you would want to have some sort of indemnity in place. You have to take into consideration the investment that you have to make in terms of going paperless or going digital. The cost, the cost of this, the hardware and the software. The scanners are going to cost money. A cloud subscription is going to cost money. If you're going to be using mostly paperless systems, then you may want to invest in larger monitors for reading. You may want to have tablet devices for portability. And of course, there are other costs that you may not even take into consideration, but the network equipment, the cables, the routers, etc. all of these things need to be taken into consideration. And of course, you need a reliable and fast internet connection. So those are some of the considerations in a paperless office. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this type of content, please drop a like on this video and subscribe to the channel. Stay tuned for much more from Carlo Lu, the channel for the modern Caribbean attorney.